Okay, thank you. Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's teleconference on the Lunar Science Secondary Payloads flying on NASA's Artemis I mission. I'm Rachel Kraft with NASA's Office of Communications. Artemis I will be an uncrewed flight test that will provide a foundation for human exploration in deep space and demonstrate our commitment and capability to extend human existence to the moon and eventually Mars. The agency is currently targeting no earlier than Monday, August 29th, for the launch of the Space Launch System rocket to send the Orion spacecraft around the moon and back to Earth. Today you'll hear from people who have developed and built CubeSats, small satellites that will ride to space inside an adapter ring on the rocket called the Orion Stage Adapter to primarily investigate the lunar environment. After the Orion spacecraft is flying on its own toward the moon, these shoebox-sized CubeSats will be deployed from dispensers on the adapter ring. While CubeSats each come with risk to their own individual missions, they yield high potential to fill gaps in our knowledge of the solar system. We have several experts lined up to talk to you today. Uh, they are Jacob Bleacher, NASA Chief Exploration Scientist, Craig Hardgrove, Principal Investigator for the CubeSat Luna Map and a professor with Arizona State University. Tatsuaki Hashimoto, Project Manager for the CubeSat Omotenashi with the Japan Aerospace Exploration Agency. Ryo Funas, Project Manager for the CubeSat Equulius with the Japan Aerospace Exploration Agency. Ben Malfris, Principal Investigator for the CubeSat Lunar Ice Cube with Moorhead State University and Joseph Shore, Lockheed Martin's architect for small sat missions. Uh, Joseph will be talking about uh, the CubeSat Moon IR. Um, we'll have a few opening comments from each of our speakers, and then we'll take questions from reporters on the phone line. Reporters can enter star one on your phone to be entered into the question queue. And uh, with that, we'll start with Jacob Bleacher. Thanks, Rachel. Can you just confirm you hear me? We do indeed. All right. Thanks, Rachel. Uh, and it's a pleasure to be here this afternoon to speak to everybody. Um, you know, we're at the beginning of an exciting adventure, an adventure to explore the moon, but not only to explore the moon, to learn about our place in an evolving universe. Our moon serves as basically a celestial library right next door. From here, we can begin to research our history. Lunar rocks and lunar ice basically serve as the books of this library. We can use them to learn, to read them, and to begin to reveal how the solar system has evolved. This can really help us gain insight into what was happening here on Earth when life was establishing a foothold in the solar system. Here on Earth, the very characteristics that make life possible, for instance, our atmosphere and water, well, those are the same characteristics that tend to erase those pieces of our planet's history. However, at the moon, the same characteristics that challenge the existence of life are the same characteristics that have helped preserve evidence of our history. For instance, not having an atmosphere. Everything that's happened there has left a trace. But those are the traces we can't find here on Earth. Not only can we learn about our Earth-Moon system, but learning from the moon will help set the scientific context from which we can interpret our observations from across the solar system. Artemis One will test our spacecraft and hardware that we'll use to carry astronauts to the moon. Additionally, Artemis One will enable us to test the use of CubeSats as secondary payloads that can be delivered beyond low Earth orbit like most other CubeSats are. One of the great things about the payloads we'll be talking about today and on the remaining telecons that NASA will hold the rest of the week, it's the number of organizations both inside and outside of NASA that are coming along in this flight with us. Payloads are instruments on Artemis One reflect contributions from across our agency. They include five international partners and partnerships with a number of universities and industry and other research institutions. CubeSats are a lower cost approach to capturing scientific measurements. They're high risk, but high reward. And each successful measurement these Artemis CubeSats uh, can add to our knowledge to the moon and how we travel in deep space. 
This demonstrates the collaborative nature of science and exploration. I often like to say that science is our toolbox for survival during exploration. These CubeSats will provide new understanding of the lunar environment, which in turn will help us better design our exploration systems, help keep our crew safe, and help hardware survive longer at the moon. So this really is an exciting time as we uh, get ready for this adventure. Now we have, I'm really excited to, uh, to introduce a few more of our experts from several of the CubeSat teams. First, I'd like to hand over to Craig Hardgrove, Principal Investigator for the CubeSat Luna H map, and he's with the Arizona State University. Uh, thanks a lot, Jake. Um, Luna map was the first uh, simplex mission selected through NASA's Science Mission Directorate. It's a, a new type of mission uh, for NASA, but it follows a similar structure to uh, previous uh, missions that are much larger, where we have a, a PI that is a planetary scientist that proposes a, a large science question, in our case about the moon, and we uh, execute a mission to conduct uh, addressing that question. And so as the first um, simplex selection, uh, we're really a pathfinder for navigating a lot of the challenges that come along with uh, doing a, a big science mission uh, on a very small satellite. Um, and so we've, we've known for quite some time that there's water ice at the moon's poles, uh, but there are a lot of unanswered questions about how much there is and where exactly it is. Um, most of it is within these permanently shadowed regions at the South Pole. These are some of the coldest locations in the entire solar system, and they may have never seen sunlight, and it's the only place on the moon where we know that water ice really would be stable for prolonged periods of time. Um, there's evidence that there may be ice uh, within the sunlit plains uh, that might be stable for millennia in those regions, but we simply don't have high enough resolution data of both poles of the moon to really address some of these questions. Um, and so that's where LunaMap came in. And in order to do that, we're using a, a tried and true technique called neutron spectroscopy. Um, NASA has actually flown two neutron instruments to the moon before, um, but with LunaMap, we're enabled, uh, because we're one science instrument on such a small spacecraft, we're able to plan the mission and navigate into a very low altitude South Pole orbit so that we can pass over these regions of the South Pole and reveal whether or not there are enrichments of ice only within the permanently shadowed regions or if the ice actually extends out into the illuminated plains. And this will tell us really important constraints about um, how water was delivered into the inner solar system, how much water was there uh, at the moon's formation. It also tells us how water is redistributed across the moon from subsequent impacts and meteorite bombardment. Um, so it's, it's really an important um, element of uh, the Artemis program to understand how much ice is at the pole, both for future exploration missions, both with humans as well as robots, um, uh, to understand how to plan future missions at the scale of a landing ellipse uh, so we know where to go to find these ice enrichments, um, as well as uncovering sort of uh, how the, the evolution of the moon evolved is uh, with respect to uh, water ice mobilizing on the surface um, of the moon. Um, and I, I think I would end it there and just say if you have any other questions or any, any or information about LunaMap, we have a website at lunamap.asu.edu, as well as a new press kit, which will answer a lot of your questions and have some graphics. Um, and with that, I'll hand it off to uh, Tatsuaki Hashimoto uh, with JAXA. Uh, thank you. Uh, I'm Tatsuaki Hashimoto from JAXA, project manager of Omotenashi. Uh, the name of Omotenashi comes from outstanding moon exploration technologies demonstrated by Nano Semi Hard Impactor. Uh, sorry for a long name. Uh, as the name shows, it is a challenge for the world's smallest moon lander. Uh, there is no room to be equipped with landing sensors or precisely controlled liquid propulsion system on a CubeSat. So, Omotenashi uses a solid rocket motor for the deceleration and adopts semi-hard landing technology, uh, not soft landing. 
uh, its remaining uh, landing speed will be around 50 meter per second. So uh, we needed to develop shock absorption technologies, uh, crushable material, and an uh, epoxy filling of the instrument box. Moreover, uh, to reduce the landing mass, the spacecraft separates uh, in orbit just before landing. Uh, Omotenashi has also an ultra-small radiation monitor and measures the radiation environment of Earth's moon region. Uh, it is remodeled uh, from the portable radiation monitor developed after Fukushima nuclear plant accident. Its weight is about 20 gram. And uh, uh, Omotenashi itself is not a science mission, uh, but its demonstrated technologies will enable future small surface uh, science missions. And uh, after launch, on the second day, Omotenashi will conduct orbital maneuver to put into lunar uh, impact orbit. The trajectory is carefully designed so as to maximize the probability of landing success. The ignition timing of solid rocket motor is very important, so we will conduct precise orbit determination for a few days. Uh, on the fifth or sixth day, Omotenashi will land a moon. Uh, this is an overview of Omotenashi mission. And I'm going to pass on to the next speaker, uh, my colleague, Professor Funase from Equilibrium Mission. Okay, uh, I'm Liu Funase from JAXA, and I'm the project manager of Equilibrium. So let me uh, give you an overview of the Equilibrium mission. Equilibrium and also Omotenashi introduced earlier our uh, JAXA's second mission to send a micro or nano spacecraft into deep space beyond the moon. So we are very grateful to NASA for providing us with this uh, valuable launch opportunity into deep space. The primary mission of Equilus is to expand the capability of CubeSat in deep space by demonstrating trajectory control techniques within the Sun-Earth-Moon region. In this mission, we aim to efficiently reach a periodic orbit around the second Lagrange point of the Earth-Moon system by utilizing lunar gravity assist and solar gravity. This orbit control technology will enable a CubeSat class spacecraft with uh, limited resources to depart from a future deep space port such as Lunar Orbiter Platform Gateway and fly into deep space with its own propulsion system. It will contribute to greatly expanding uh, our opportunities for future science missions around the moon and beyond. To accomplish this mission, we developed and installed a new propulsion system using water as a propellant. Water is, you know, an extremely safe and non-toxic propellant, and if this propulsion system is demonstrated, it will uh, improve CubeSat mission capability while, uh, and ensuring safety for various future rideshare launch opportunities. In addition to the technology demonstration mission explained so far, Equilus will conduct three other scientific observation missions. One is an imaging mission of the Earth's plasma sphere, and from a far distance from the Earth, Equilus will observe the whole view of the large structure of helium ion in the Earth's plasma sphere. This will contribute to the better understanding of the physical process which governs the terrestrial plasma of the Earth. The second is the mission to image and characterize the lunar impact of flashes. This observation will monitor the moon's surface and detect the flash of light emitted by the high-velocity meteorites which impact on the moon's surface. And this mission will characterize the flux of such meteorites in order to contribute to the risk evaluation for the future human activity or infrastructure on the moon's surface. The third one is a mission to detect cosmic dust and evaluate the dust environment in the cis lunar space. This observation is made possible uh, without the need for extra resources from the spacecraft uh, by integrating thin film dust detectors into the inside of the spacecraft thermal blank. 
In addition to the tech demo mission to enhance the capability of Deep Space CubeSat, as I explained earlier, the three science missions are expected to deepen our understanding of the radiation environment around the Earth, and also the spatial distribution of the solid objects such as meteorites and dust in the Earth's most region. Uh, this is an overview of ECHO's mission, and I'm going to pass on to the next speaker. So Thank you, Professor Funasi. This is Ben Malfres, the principal investigator on the Lunar Ice Cube mission. CubeSats are going to the moon. It is such an exciting time. Uh, we really feel like we're at the beginning of a new era of space exploration, one that's ushered in and supported by small satellite platforms like these CubeSats on the Artemis mission. Uh, Lunar Ice Cube is a partnership between Warhead State University, the NASA Goddard Space Flight Center, the Jet Propulsion Laboratory, the NASA Independent Verification Validation Center over in West Virginia, and the BUSEC Space Propulsion Company. Like the other CubeSats on Artemis One, uh, Lunar Ice Cube is a 6U CubeSat, uh, 14 kilograms or so, about the size of a carry-on piece of luggage. And the science mission for Lunar Ice Cube is to uh, prospect for water ice. The interesting thing to me is that along with um, uh, LunaMap and uh, others on the Artemis One mission, we're uh, creating really the first ad hoc lunar constellation of satellites that are uh, targeting um, common observations, common targets, and producing uh, uh, very um, complementary science data. Uh, specifically, Lunar Ice Cube is looking for water ice in liquid and vapor forms and other lunar volatiles we, we have the sensitivity to, to see. Um, but specifically looking at the distribution of, of water ice uh, from the mid-latitudes uh, to, uh, to the PSRs, the permanently shadowed regions uh, where it, it tends to, to collect. Um, so Lunar Ice Cube is actually a science mission um, and a tech demo mission. There are a number of really innovative, unusual technologies that um, are sort of enabling technologies that allow us to do this kind of science with, with small, um, small platforms. Um, the instrument is a very innovative instrument built by NASA Goddard. It's um, an infrared, infrared spectrometer. We call it the, the Birch's uh, spectrometer. Um, has excellent uh, sensitivity in the one to four micron range where we'll, we'll, we'll see the uh, water ice line in absorption. Uh, there are other technologies like um, an electric propulsion system, very innovative propulsion system. It's an RF ion electric propulsion system developed by, uh, by BUSEC. And there are a number of other uh, enabling technologies, but together uh, with the infrared spectrometer and these other enabling technologies, we hope to contribute to some of the um, un, unknown elements of the strategic knowledge gaps uh, related to the moon and lunar volatiles. So with that, I will turn it over to Joseph Shore from the Lunar IR team. Thank you, Ben. We're looking forward to the Artemis I launch, not just to return astronauts to the moon, but to start building up an eventual full-scale lunar economy CubeSats like LUNIR and other spacecraft on this call today are a new and different way to learn more about Earth's nearest neighbor and what challenges it could pose for future human missions. They're also an opportunity to prove out technologies that could be useful for future lunar science. So I'd like to talk briefly about Lockheed Martin's CubeSat catching a ride on the Artemis I mission, LUNIR. The LUNIR project is a public-private partnership through NASA's Next Space Technologies for Exploration Partnerships, or Next Step, program. Next Step is run through the Advanced Exploration Systems Group at NASA and is focused on technology demonstrations. LUNIR is one of these. Uh, it's short for Lunar Infrared, and for its technology demonstration mission, LUNIR aims to conduct a flyby of the moon and prove out an ultra-compact novel infrared camera by taking a series of images that observe the lunar surface and its thermal signatures. What makes this imager particularly useful is that it can map the moon in both day and night and measure things like the way sunlight is reflected or absorbed by the moon's surface. 
we're hoping to see how well this imaging technology works so that it might be applied for things like future planetary scouting missions. And in addition, the types of thermal data LUNIR would look for could eventually be critical in helping identify water on the moon, which in turn drives selection of things like future lunar landing sites or outpost locations. Uh, one of the challenges that these lunar CubeSats face is packing a lot of technology into a very small volume. And one example on LUNIR is that infrared sensors typically need to be accompanied by a cooling system so that they uh, give good performance uh, in, in the images they return. And because of its complex, excuse me, because of its compact size, LUNIR has the lightest long life space cryocooler ever built by the Advanced Technology Center uh, in Palo Alto. This is an example of just one of the types of challenges that we have to engineer for on these uh, high risk, high reward missions. So LUNIR was funded by Lockheed Martin uh, with the launch provided by NASA. Uh, Lockheed Martin's Optical Payload Center of Excellence in Sunnyvale, California built the infrared imager and our Advanced Technology Center in Palo Alto, California built that cryocooler that I mentioned. The LUNIR 6U CubeSat bus was built, tested and integrated by Terran Orbital in Irvine, California. And on the whole, Lockheed Martin is really excited to be part of NASA's efforts around the moon from designing, building, and testing the Orion spacecraft to proving out new technology with LUNIR and even participating in future lunar imaging missions like Lunar Trailblazer and beyond. So I'm eager to see how what we learn now with all of these missions uh, across the different size classes can be applied as, as uh, uh, future lessons learned when human humanity has a, a growing number of assets at the moon. Uh, thank you, and at this point, I'll pass it back to Rachel. Okay, thanks. Um, we'll now begin the question and answer portion. Um, as a reminder, you can enter star one on your phone to be entered into the question queue. Uh, your phones are on mute now, and the operator will open your mic when uh, you're ready for your question and close your mic after you ask your question. Um, and we ask that you please stick to one question each. Uh, and given that we have a number of uh, speakers on today's call, please identify to whom your question is directed. Um, if we do have time, we'll, we'll allow reporters to ask a second question. Um, and we will start with Megan Bartles with space.com. You okay? Megan Bartles, Can you your line is open. Can you hear me okay? Hello? Hey, Megan, we can hear you. All right. Okay, great, thanks. <laughs> uh, could each of the panelists representing a specific CubeSat state the planned primary mission duration for the CubeSat and any key milestones we should be looking for? Thanks. And for that, I think uh, let's go in the order of the speakers. So, Craig, let's start with you. Uh, sure. We we deploy the LunaMap deploys from SLS about five and a half hours after launch. Uh, we should have a first contact from the spacecraft within about 30 minutes of deployment. Um, beyond that, we will spend about the next uh, four or five days um, performing a lunar gravity assist to fly by the moon. Um, if we successfully hit that gravity assist, we go out to uh, about a million and a half miles past the moon and back. That takes about four months. Um, and then we transition once we're captured at the moon into a science orbit that takes us about 12 months. So all told, our mission would be about uh, 14 or 15 months long, um, with the last part of the science phase being about um, two to four months long. Tatsuaki. Oh, yeah. Uh, I, I'm sorry, I couldn't catch the uh, questions exactly. Oh. The question about uh, was about um, expected mission duration for each payload. Oh, okay. Uh, okay. Yeah, uh, as I, I already explained, yeah, Obotenashi's mission is about uh, less than one week, about uh, five days, like so. Yeah. Uh, yeah, after separated from SLS, 
uh, omotenashi change that will be to impact to the moon and directly go to moon and the land. And uh, after landing, uh, its lifetime will be about a few minutes because of the summer conditions or something like that. You. Onto you. Yes. Uh, yes. <clears throat> uh, mm, so uh, Echoes is the first uh, CubeSat to be deployed from SLS Artemis One, and uh, just after the the separation, we will have um, DSN contact path to uh, where we will verify the uh, health status of the spacecraft, and after that uh, we will. <clears throat> excuse me. We will conduct the uh, trajectory correction maneuver to target the uh, spacecraft to the to our nominal trajectory. And uh, after uh, performing lunar flyby uh, in a week, um, we will conduct the deep space flight to the uh, lunar Lagrange point uh, that will uh, take about one year or so. And after that, we will enter into the, our mission orbit around the Lagrange point and uh, conduct uh, science missions, as I explained. Uh, for, for Lunar Ice Cube, uh, it's uh, fairly similar to the others. We're um, more or less um, a two-year mission. Uh, we get deployed at bus stop one, um, three hours or so later, we have our first contact. We have a series of deterministic maneuvers to set us up for lunar flyby about five days uh, after launch. But the interesting thing beyond that is uh, we go on a long circuitous route using the interplanetary superhighway for about 180 days. We go as far out as 1.8 million kilometers uh, from the from the Earth, and then we fall back to the Earth Moon system uh, in the right dynamic state to undergo a capture. Uh, we'll stay in the near rectilinear halo orbit uh, for um, a TBD period of time, and then we'll dive into a science orbit. And you know, why does it take so long uh, to get to the Moon when you know we go flying by the Moon in in five days? Uh, but we can only carry 1.3 kilograms of propellant, so. You can't turn around and, and thrust in the anti-velocity uh, direction uh, to extract energy and go directly into lunar capture. So we go on this long circuitous route um, that allows us to utilize uh, our low thrust engines, extraordinarily low amount of propellant, and basically the laws of physics of the solar system to allow us to get into uh, a lunar orbit. So you have to be a little bit more patient, but with one a little over a kilogram of propellant, uh, we can still get into a, a, a very appropriate science orbit that takes us about 100 kilometers, uh, by the way, above the, the lunar surface. So uh, thanks for the very interesting question. Let's see, and Joseph, uh, can you comment on mission duration for Luna IR? Uh, yes, I can. Um, Luna IR is a pretty quick mission, not quite as as short as Omotenashi, it sounds like. Um, we are a a lunar flyby, um, so after. Um, sorry, can I ask if uh, can you confirm you're hearing me okay? Yes, we can hear you. Okay, great. Uh, thanks. Um, yeah, we we deploy from the the launch vehicle about six and a half hours after launch. Um, we'll do some demonstration activities with our sensor pretty quickly after that. Um, and, uh, and, and then uh, we fly past the moon where we do most of our um, uh, images, image taking of the moon, uh, and then downlink the data from that. So it's a pretty, it's a pretty short uh, timeline. Uh, we are not planning for the mission to last longer than 30 days. Okay, thank you. Um, we'll take our next question from Jeff Faust with Space News. Yeah, good afternoon. <clears throat> Pardon me. I know uh, some of the missions are, are dealing with an issue that you delivered your satellites a year ago and haven't had a chance to uh, recharge your batteries. I'm just curious. Um, what you're doing to try to mitigate the risk from the 
steadily discharging batteries, um, and what that implies for uh, mission success. You know, what, what the odds are you'll be able to uh, carry out your missions. Thanks. Yeah, this is yeah. Jake Bleacher. I can take that one. Uh, so, yeah, as you said, the uh, space, um, each of these CubeSats was delivered um, a little bit over a year ago and were, uh, were installed into the SLS stack. Um, at that point, there were several that had the capability of being recharged, and then there were several um, that simply did not have that capability uh, once we were uh, stacked. Um, at this point, um, it's, uh, it's difficult to uh, apply any more charge to those CubeSats. Um, so we're trying to work through uh, preparations and get the SLS ready to fly. Um, that's the best thing that we can do at this point. Um, you know, the primary goal here is to fly the SLS in the Orion uh, and check out that system, make sure that it will work and is ready to go for Artemis II when we'll have uh, our astronauts on board. Um, so right now what we can do um, is, uh, again, we had several that we were able to recharge, several that we are not. We are trying to monitor them, and if we get uh, the SLS off, uh, the end of this month, early September. Uh, we hope that um, they'll all have an opportunity to be able to fly. But as we mentioned, uh, CubeSats, you know, they're kind of a high risk, high reward, that reward coming from the fact that they're lower cost. And so, you know, as we develop Artemis, we're learning about how to partner um, with these types of capabilities. The kind of the size of these CubeSats, um, you heard several folks talking about, you know, some of the decisions that have to be made uh, as you develop these, these uh, CubeSats. You can't have everything in there that you would have in a full-size spacecraft, and choices had to be made um, to enable us to go and fly these things so that we can make the measurements. Um, in that case, there's maybe a few that we can't get recharged. So, again, the, you asked what we can do to mitigate at this point trying to get the SLS off the ground. That's the thing we can do to get these up there and, and um, get these uh, CubeSats out so they can get themselves unfolded and get going. Okay, thank you. Um, we'll next go to Yusuke Tomiyama with Yomi Yori Shimuen. Uh, thank you for taking my question. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Uh, my question is for Dr. Funase and Dr. Hashimoto. I know you have been waiting for this launch for a long, long time. So let me know your expectations for the launch now. Thank you. Okay. Yeah, uh, I, I don't get the uh, meaning of the expectation, uh, but uh, yeah. Uh, we are be, now uh, very exciting about uh, uh, just before launch, and uh, uh, yeah, and uh, we are p preparing for the uh, in orbit operation. Uh, for, for, fortunately, uh, we have uh, uh, a lot of time to prepare the uh, in orbit operation. So. Uh, uh, we have uh, some confidence to uh, do the uh, in-orbit operation. Yeah, and uh, uh, yeah, uh, I'm Ruth from uh, JAXA, and I, um, as I explained earlier, the uh, this is the JAXA second. Uh, opportunity to send uh, CubeSat or microsat into deep space. So uh, we are very excited to have this uh, wonderful launch opportunity into deep space. So um, yeah, uh, we're very excited to, to have to to perform our mission successfully. Yeah. Thank you. The next question is from Ramin Skiba with Wired. Uh, hello. Um, I had a question um, about uh, uh, um, just one second. 
uh, for uh, um, Tatsuaki Hashimoto. This is about the Omotenashi mission. Um, I, I was just wondering, I, 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 I think I missed it, but like, what, what is the advantage of making a semi-hard landing? Like, what, what, uh, what, what uh, is this useful for certain kinds of landers, uh, like future, future possible missions? Oh, okay, yeah. Uh, semi-hard landing has, uh, I can say, uh, a, a little risky and uh, uh, many uh, disadvantages here. Uh, but uh, uh, for the, such a small size CubeSat, uh, we can select only a semi-hard landing, uh, I think, uh, because uh, uh, we have no room to both uh, uh, precise uh, landing radar or uh, precisely control propulsion system or like so. So uh, we need uh, to uh, take uh, semi-hard landing. And uh, yeah, semi-hard landing, uh, we need uh, some uh, shock absorption uh, technologies. So uh, we cannot both uh, very precise sensors, but uh, uh, usual uh, electric circuit, uh, for example, a uh, camera, uh, infrared camera, or some uh, science instrument uh, will be possible to stand the uh, high shock G. So uh, that enables uh, uh, future small uh, surface missions. Uh, I hope. Thank you. Our next question is from Marcia Smith with Space Policy Online. Thanks so much. I don't know if Dr. Bleacher wants to answer this for everybody or if each of the CubeSat uh, PIs would like to answer for themselves, but I'm curious, of these five CubeSats, which ones could not be recharged and how much will that affect the possibility that they'll succeed? Uh, I can I can answer that. Um, and this, this is Jake again. I can answer that, and then um, if anyone else wants to add to that, they certainly can. Um, so yeah, five of the CubeSats had the ability to be recharged, and five um, were not in a um, status that we were confident we could recharge them. Uh, Luna HMAP is one of those. Cusp. Lunar IR, Team Miles, and the Lunar Ice Cube uh, were the five that um, were not in a in a status where we were confident we could uh, could get those recharged, and or they chose not to have them recharged. Uh, as I said into the earlier question, monitoring them uh, as best as we can. Uh, we believe that if we are able to launch towards the end of August, early September, which is our current uh, target. Uh, that, that most, if not all, of these CubeSats will be able to, uh, to become active after they are uh, deposited from the SLS and Orion, uh, but we'll have to find out when they get out there. Okay, thank you. Our next question is from Stephen Clark with Spaceflight Now. Hi, thanks for taking my question. Um, since uh, Luna HMAP was one of the ones that was not recharged, I'll ask uh, uh, Craig about that. Uh, why wasn't that particular CubeSat unable to be recharged? And uh, do you have any concerns about that adding uh, any risk to your mission? Thanks. Uh, sure, thanks for the question. Um, yeah, so that was a decision um, that came out of one of the reviews with the SLS program. Um, so the, the SLS program uh, didn't feel comfortable with us charging. Um, and so uh, that's why that decision was made. But I, I don't, uh, you know, it, it's a, it is a concern. Like Jake said, it's, there's a, these are high risk missions. Um, however, uh, looking at our um, rate of self discharge that we measured prior to delivery um, and moving forward with looking at the late August, early September launch, um, I think we should be in a pretty good position, just like Jake said. Um, if we happen to be below the minimum state of charge uh, required to boot our flight computer, um, we do have two exposed solar panels um, after we are um, um, removed, after the dispenser uh, kicks us out uh, into space. And so those two panels um, will charge the batteries. And assuming that uh, the batteries are not 
um, depleted all the way to zero, uh, we should be able to charge those in not too much time after deployment. So um, all the CubeSats are in a slightly different situation, but for LunaMap, I, I think we should be okay um, with the, the launch coming up soon. Thank you. Our next question is from Christopher Kokones with Astronomy. Yes, hi, thank you. Um, I, I think we got a couple responses from uh, our the JAXA colleagues. Uh, so I guess this is directed, the, so it's sort of a two-part question, first for Craig and Ben. Um, how are you guys feeling right now? Like uh, how much anxiety, hope, excitement? You could just give us a little sense of the human side of how you're feeling. And then I'm curious where each of the, of the PIs will be physically located during the launch and during the CubeSat separation a couple hours later. Thank you and good luck, everyone. Thanks for the question. This is Ben. I'll, I'll, um, I'll go first, but I think you described the mix of, of feelings uh, with great precision. Um, hope, anxiety, excitement, uh, happiness, all, all mixed together. It's, uh, you know, um, it's been a long and fairly complex uh, journey. Um, these are some of the most complex uh, CubeSats ever, ever produced. And to get the performance uh, levels that are required to do the science, um, you know, we had to push the envelope. You had to, you had to take risks. And so, you know, we all, as uh, program engineers, balance those risks against the, the science capabilities. And, you know, it comes down to um, a little bit of a gamble uh, in the end. Um, you know, how, how much did you want to push the envelope in terms of uh, the to uh, toward what, what level of gains? And so um, that, that part's really exciting. Um, we've had, um, gosh, 50 plus students working on Lunar Ice Cube uh, over the uh, five, six, seven years of its uh, development. And uh, we have a lot of students that, and graduates now that are really excited to see, to, to see it fly. So, um, you know, a, a, a complex mix of emotions for a, a very complex uh, set of, of small satellites. Yeah, this is Craig. I'll, I'll just add to what Ben said. I agree with everything Ben said. I just add, you know, it's been so great to uh, get to know this you know, community of scientists and engineers. I, I met Ben seven years ago or so, and I, I feel like, you know, we have gone through a lot of the same struggles together developing these systems. And so I'm more than anything, um, in addition to all the feelings you mentioned, extremely excited and happy to uh, have these projects move on to the next phase of their lives. Um, I, for me, this is uh, really like a like a third child. <laughs> so, <laughs> sending it off to the moon and uh, getting to see it uh, have a chance at completing its mission is is really a, a special thing. So, and this is Joseph Shore from Lunar. I'll, I'll just add to this that that uh, you know we hit a lot of major milestones in our integration and test and and delivering the spacecraft uh, to the launch site last year, and so. You know, kind of no, no matter what happens in the in the mission, we've already learned a lot. We've already uh, had some major accomplishments, uh, and and we're excited to see the next phase of operations. Okay. Any others want to address that? Okay. Uh, we'll take another question. Uh, this one from David Curley with Discovery Channel. Thank you much for taking the question. Hashimoto-san, can you explain a little bit about the technology from Fukushima? And will that instrument uh, record not just on the way down, but on the surface of the moon as well? Thank you. Oh, okay. Yeah. Uh, unfortunately, uh, we had a very, uh, I can say, uh, sad uh, uh, Fukushima nuclear plant accident. And after that, uh, we need to monitor the radiation environment, uh, even for the school children. So uh, uh, the Japanese Institute uh, developed uh, a very small portable radiation monitor uh, for the children. Uh, so uh, after that, uh, we uh, JAXA 
uh, started the research uh, to use uh, for uh, that uh, small monitor to the astronauts uh, or uh, such kind of uh, small uh, sensors can both uh, every uh, spacecraft uh, because uh, it is a very low uh, power consumption and a very small size. Uh, so uh, our mission is a uh, test uh, for the, such a tiny uh, small sensors uh, can uh, detect the uh, uh, radiation environment uh, precisely or not. Uh, yeah, th that is uh, another challenge. But uh, if possible, uh, we uh, uh, would like to spread uh, such kind of a small sensors to uh, every spacecraft uh, to the moon or uh, Mars or uh, some destination. Thank you. Thank you. We'll take another question uh, from Irene Klotz with Aviation Week. Thanks very much. Um, I'm not sure who uh, might be best or interested in answering this question, but um, you mentioned, a couple of you mentioned about the um, technology uh, uh, pathfinders that these missions are intended to demonstrate. So I was wondering, in the um, six or seven years since these projects were initially selected to fly on SLS, uh, which I think at the time it was supposed to go in 2018, have any of the technologies um, been surpassed or tested by um, other satellites and other programs? In other words, is any of the pioneering technology now moved on to a, a demonstration of a system that's already been um, previously demonstrated? Thanks. I think that's an excellent question. This has been, I'll, I'll give a um, preliminary answer. And um, the, the short answer is, is certainly some technologies have, have evolved. Uh, particularly looking at our infrared spectrometer, um, you know, there are um, probably uh, better um, small miniaturized uh, cryo coolers available, uh, for example. So certainly there have been some, uh, some improvements there. Um, you know, CubeSats are really good at demonstrating technology uh, quickly in LEO, but uh, almost no CubeSats have flown in deep space. The Marco uh, CubeSats are really the exception, and then, uh, then the Artemis I CubeSat. So most of the technologies are really designed for operation in deep space, you know, getting from one place to another in deep space, like uh, the, the um, uh, high ISP low-thrust uh, propulsion systems and some of the more rad uh, hard systems. So those really haven't been demonstrated in the CubeSat form factor uh, in an appropriate environment. So I think it's an excellent question, but I, I think there's still – a lot of very valid uh, tech demo uh, to be done and, and many things to be learned uh, technology-wise uh, from these missions. Yeah, and this is Joseph Shore from LUNIR. Um, we are still interested in demonstrating the infrared sensor on, on LUNIR, uh, but to your question, one element of that sensor, the micro cryo cooler, um, that I highlighted in my initial remarks uh, has actually made its way into some some instruments on on some uh, additional missions. Uh, it, it's going to be part of the Psyche mission and the Europa Clipper mission. Um, so while the development happened on on Luna IR and we're anticipating that flight, uh, we have seen the technology is already transferring into much larger missions. And this is Craig with LunaMap. Um, the, the neutron detector that um, we developed for LunaMap um, has a unique capability uh, that is sensitive to both neutrons and gamma rays. Um, and that, that technology has not flown yet um, in space, although it has been tested and, uh, for radiation damage and hardening and uh, issues associated with that, and everything looks good. Um, but we will be uh, one of the first to fly this uh, sensor material uh, into deep space. Um, and there are other uh, sensor technologies that, that might have useful applications in a similar class for future planetary science missions, but so far, um, uh, LunaMap will still be the first to fly that. 
Um, and I and also just wanted to add maybe to, to Ben's point, uh, the, the 6U is a very challenging form factor. Uh, it's, it's incredibly small. Um, and so, you know, I hope that uh, the success of many of these CubeSats on Artemis One demonstrates that these, uh, you know, that, that there should be future technology investment in, in um, propulsion systems and uh, all the technologies that make these spacecraft go um, to, to enable future missions. So looking forward to that, but I, I think that uh, we're still uh, very close to state of the art at this point. Yeah, uh, I'm say from Equus. Ah, okay, okay. Can I speak? Yes, go right ahead. Ah, okay. So uh, <clears throat> the the technical mission of Equus is uh, the demonstrating demonstration of the, the very efficient trajectory control techniques that uh, enable a CubeSat to reach a uh, lunar Lagrange point with uh, a few tens tens of meters per second. And I think this uh, technology is uh, has not been demonstrated by other missions. So I think the uh, tech mission for ECHOS is still valid at, at this moment. Uh, this, this, this is uh, Tatsaki Hashimoto from Omotenashi. Yeah, uh, uh, the Omotenashi uh, demonstrates uh, semi-hard landing technologies and uh, uh, that will enable the new science missions. Uh, so uh, if Aruna scientists uh, who uh, are interested in the, this uh, kind of technology, uh, we can uh, cooperate uh, with, with them. Okay, thank you. And we have time for one last question from Marvin Marshall with Nighttime News Space Report. Hi, thank you so much for taking uh, Good evening. Um, my question goes out uh, to the Lunar Ice Cube mission uh, team here. Um, now, you guys said that you, you, the goal is to pretty much investigate a, a, the distribution of water and other volatiles. Uh, on, on the surface of the moon there. Now, are you guys looking into uh, finding any type of propellant for, uh, you know, future rockets or landers that might be landing there? Thank you. Oh, boy, that's an excellent question. Um, of course, uh, many of us have an interest in in-situ uh, resource utilization, and uh, water, uh, of course, um, could be ultimately uh, harvested on the moon and disassociated into oxygen, which is an oxidizer, um, and, uh, and of course has other valuable uh, uses, and, and hydrogen. So, um, in theory, you could certainly create uh, both propellant and an oxidizer uh, out of the, the water ice on the moon. It has many, many uses in, for um, litter bases, um, for uh, propulsion systems, uh, for uh, for uh, industrial uh, activities on the moon, uh, but absolutely for uh, for for propellant. So, um, excellent question, and, and the, the short answer is an enthusiastic yes. Okay, that's all we have time for today. Uh, I want to thank everyone for joining us today, uh, including our participants. Um, we do have two other uh, media teleconferences this week to talk about the additional payloads flying uh, on Artemis One, some inside Orion, as well as additional CubeSats that we did not discuss today. Um, the next one up is at noon Eastern time tomorrow, where we'll discuss technology demonstrations. Um, and if you missed it earlier today, NASA is also now targeting tomorrow, August 16th, at 9 p.m. Eastern to begin rolling the Artemis One rocket and spacecraft to the launch pad. You can find more about all of these payloads as well as the Artemis One mission at nasa.gov slash Artemis-1. Thank you. <laughs>